Uh, hold on, let's start this. Right, uh, so first uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for their kind invitation, which I hope they won't uh, regret as I go along. Um, uh, it's always, it's a bit difficult to start uh, talking at the very early days of such a large and varied uh, institute because it's difficult to gauge you know, how to talk, what, how, how far to go, and so on and so forth. The advantage is that I can guarantee you, and you can start tweeting that right now, that is, so far it's one of the best uh, five talks of the symposium. Um, so uh, please do, uh, before it's too late. Um, and so I asked, in fact, I asked Stephen uh, uh, some advice on, on, on what to, uh, but to talk, not what to talk about, but how general, how, how uh, specific, and what uh, he mentioned was to be as general as possible, and focus on the, on the topic of the Institute, which is the, the, the causal role of consciousness, and uh, how and why do organisms uh, feel. And I have no idea about any of that, um, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'll do instead, it'll be quite different from what you've heard so far. I'm going to show you data, lots of data. Um, I'm not going to, I have no grand theories, have no I, sort of uh, actually many ideas of my own. Um, so uh, the goal, the idea, the hope is that uh, you can use that data to uh, help you interpret uh, for better or for worse some of the things that have been said and some of the things that will be said uh, along the, uh, the school and, and, and see whether, you know, it, it, they, they sort of fit with what some of what we know about the, uh, the neural uh, basis of, of some of the emotional processing. So uh, if you're interested in that, sort of, uh, brace yourself, hold your coffee cups, and, and, and enjoy the ride. And if you're not, I'll just wake you up when it's time for the coffee break, and we'll all be happy. Um, and uh, speaking of fear, it's not a very uh, reassuring thing when your mentor uh, starts his talk uh, saying that he's going to rethink his entire research career. Um, and you're next. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> Well, I think I think I'm, I will do okay, but uh, we'll see. Um, so, uh, because it's Saturday morning, uh, let me uh, start by sort of summarizing about 100 years of, of, of research of, of what we know. What is the fear side? The amygdala, the It's a big area in the physical. Right, so that's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> and um, it's not that I don't trust Joe, but uh, when I saw that, I said, okay, yeah. we're set. Um, <laughs> So, um, as, as, uh, as Joe and, and others uh, hinted at, uh, indeed, the, the amygdala, particularly in fear condition, which has been the model for studying um, emotional learning. So, I'm going to go and talk a, a bit uh, following uh, uh, sort of being safe uh, from, from Joe's uh, uh, comments. Uh, I'm not going to talk about feelings. I'm not going to talk about emotion. I'm going to talk about information processing. So, that's what I'm going to talk stimulus uh, uh, response or stimulus activation, stimulus response in the brain and, and in, the, in the organism. So uh, fear conditioning has been used as a, as a very uh, uh, powerful model to study some of this process, and also another, the final warning and promise. Um, a lot of the data that will show uh, I comes from experience I've been involved in. That doesn't mean in any way that I, they were the first to show whatever I'm going to show you, or that they were the best. It's just that they're the ones that I know better, so I'm more comfortable showing, as an example, my own data than somebody else's, so I can defend it a little bit better. So um, it's been shown for many, many years and many, many times that indeed if you lesion the, the amygdala, you abolish uh, fear responses, fear con condition responses as measuring rats typically as freezing responses. So uh, before uh, conditioning the, the rats don't freeze, either control or with amygdalation don't freeze to a tone, uh, but after this tone is associated with a, with a conditioned stimulus, with an electric shock, uh, the control rats freeze a lot, whereas the amygdala lesions don't seem to care much. Right? Um, and this has been shown also not just to, and, and as Joe was mentioning, although the circuits may be slightly different, uh, it's been shown that the same may occur for innate fear. And this is uh, a lot of work done by the, by the Blanchards in, in Hawaii. So if you put a, a rat, I know this is a mouse, but it's cuter. Uh, if you put a rat in, in, uh, in front of a cat, in a sedated cat to avoid uh, consequences, um, uh, so, ra so rats, as you know, are very curious creatures. So if you put them in a novel environment, they'll move around, they'll sniff, they try to find food, they, they, they do a lot of things. Uh, but if you put the cat in there, they will stop doing that. So um, if you measure things like line crossing, uh, uh, movement time, a number of approaches to the cat, a number of cat contacts, um, control rats um, 
which, which are uh, in blue will, will clearly not do much of that. They will not touch the cat. They will not approach the touch. They will basically freeze and not move, whereas amygdala uh, lesion rats couldn't care less about the cat, and they will do whatever they were doing before. In fact, my favorite quote from the, one of the original papers is they say, the single cat occurred when an amygdala uh, lesion rat climbed onto the cat's back and head and began to nibble on the cat's ear. <laughs> After the cat released this rat, the rat climbed back onto the cat. So um, clearly there was no fear. Again, we don't know what the rat was, was feeling, but clearly it was not showing any fear or any defense uh, responses. Right? Um, this is sort of a, uh, we, we're all bound, anybody who went through Joe's lab has to have a, a figure like this in, in some form or another. Uh, this is mine. Uh, so we have the amygdala, big red in there. And we have uh, um, uh, an emotional stimulus, typical an auditory stimulus in, in, in fear conditioning, reaches the thalamus. And from there, we have the traditional path that goes to auditory cortex and higher uh, union multimodal cortices that they converge into the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, then through some intramycla processing goes to go to a central nucleus, which triggers the different emotional responses. Uh, Tomasio talked a little bit about that also last, uh, yesterday. But then we have this, this sort of somewhat famous direct pathway from the thalamus, from the auditory thalamus directly subcortically to the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. So this has led to so-called the, the uh, two pathway model where we have, uh, we, we focus on the uh, uh, thalamo amygdala path under two pathways, the high and the low route, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, one is uh, direct uh, monosynaptic uh, connection between the thalamus and the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, and another one, it's a, it's a sort of longer and slower but more sophisticated path that goes through the cortical cortices and uh, converges into the amygdala. And sometimes the interesting thing is that some of these converge into the same cells, the same neurons within the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. So there's a lot of information uh, converges, but at different, slightly different times. So there's been a, a fair amount, at least back then, when I, um, interest in, in these two pathways, and there had been a lot of debate about the, the role of these two pathways, first in rats, and then more recently, we'll get to that, in, in, in humans to some extent. Um, Liz Romansky, many years ago, had shown that either of these two pathways uh, is sufficient to support fear conditioning, at least to a single, uh, to a simple stimulus like a single, like pure tone. So if you listen the either the direct uh, subcortical pathway or the indirect uh, thalamo uh, cortical amygdala pathway, the animal will still learn the association between the CS and the US. So either pathway can support simple conditioning. Um, we confirmed some of it and ex expanded a little bit, showing that the subcortical pathway, although it's a very rough, uh, not very sophisticated pathway, can still support some aspects of stimulus discrimination. So you can, you can tell apart different uh, frequency uh, tones. So. So you can do a few things, probably not, not everything, but you can do uh, some stuff. Um, the amygdala does respond to, uh, does, does show plasticity to, uh, as a function of learning, as a function of conditioning. So if you have uh, cells, neurons in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, uh, that before conditioning, they, they respond to a tone. They, there are some auditory cells in the amygdala that respond to a tone, even if the tone has no meaning but they habituate very quickly. And they have very, very brief responses, particularly at the onset. Their amygdala cells like to be onset, offset cells type of thing. They don't do much more than that. They have a very low spontaneous firing rate. They don't fire a lot. It's been argued that that's sort of a safety mechanism to prevent false alarms. Uh, but after conditioning, uh, in now in the absence of the US, but the same exact tone will elicit much more, uh, much stronger responses to the same stimulus here at the onset with very, very short latencies, uh, suggesting that this enhanced response cannot come from the cortex in terms of timing. So at least a part of this would may, should come directly from the thalamo uh, amygdala pathway, right? Uh, so the auditory cortex um, also shows plasticity, also receives information from the CS and from the US. So you have uh, much sort of uh, robust, uh, chunkier uh, auditory cells in the auditory cortex, not surprisingly. Um, they respond to a tone before conditioning, and that response gets uh, stronger after conditioning, sort of similar to, to the amygdala. So then we say, well, what's the difference between the cortex and the amygdala? They're doing basically the same thing. Um, the interesting thing about the cortex is that there are a different um, set of cells that before conditioning, they don't seem to care much about the tone. They may respond to more complex auditory stimuli, but they don't really respond much to this tone. But after conditioning, they developed 
a, a response to the tone, to the CS. And this response is a late response. And it seems to peak, sort of it, it grows until the time when the CS was about to be presented. In this day, we're in the testing phase, so we don't really present the US, but it would be as if at the time would the, the, the CS would be presented. So if you pers uh, plot the number of tone responsive cells before and after conditioning, you see that a lot of onset and offset cells as a typically auditory uh, cells, but before conditioning, that's pretty much all that happens. After conditioning, you have a, a number of cells develop this late, sort of increasing response, that's where the shock would have been, they peak and, and, and they go down. Whereas you don't see that in the amygdala. Uh, so this was work we did uh, in, with uh, Greg Quirk, and we're very uh, curious about this, and we're very, we're very young and naive, so we say, wow, this is, you know, this is an anticipatory cell, it's the kind of the, uh, the, the oh shit uh, um, uh, response that Joe was ref referring to, maybe this was, we thought could be this. So we wanted to explore more, more of this, could be an attention base, could be something like that. Um, so we say, well, but now showing that this, in fact, now these two, I was saying first that the, the, the auditory cortex and the amygdala are kind of the same. I'm saying now the cortex is even better than the amygdala because it's doing more. Now what is interesting is that if you listen to the amygdala, clearly you don't have the, the, the behavioral and physiological fear responses. We showed that. Uh, but the cortex still receives information from the thalamus. So what's going to happen if you have an, an animal that has no amygdala and you do the conditioning? Well, you don't see any... Um, overt fear response or defensive responses, but what's happening in the cortex? Well, what's happening is that the early responses still condition. So you still have early conditioning, early uh, plasticity in these onset cells. But the sort of sustained late responses are gone. Basically, they're completely gone. You don't have this anymore. Uh, in fact, it, it looks kind of like the amygdala. So this, the, the auditory cortex seems to have some part of this learning that is independent of the amygdala, but the part that is dependent on the amygdala. Even if the amygdala doesn't show that effect, it clearly drives, at least in part, these responses. Because if you listen to the amygdala, then you don't have that sustained late anticipatory response. And that's why we thought uh, this could be interesting in terms of these amygdala modulations of some sort of attentional or anticipatory uh, mechanisms. So we wanted to uh, explore this further. Um, but um, so I got interested in, in this whole thing of attention. Uh, but then I realized that it's really hard to make rats pay attention to anything, um, or at least to know what they're paying attention to, kind of like graduate students. Um, so. Um, <laughs> So I had to sort of uh, move up a notch in the, uh, in the evolutionary uh, ladder. And we can do that because, again, we've heard this uh, before, um, the fear system, or at least a defense system, or um, the, the, the defense responses are very similar across species. And this was obviously noted by, by Darwin uh, in one of his uh, calls. With all or almost all animals, even with birds, terror causes the body to tremble, the skin becomes pale, so it breaks out, and the hair bristles, as is known to be the case with man, as I've seen with cattle, dogs, cats, and monkeys. So it's a very universal response. And again, as, uh, as uh, was hinted up, it actually the, 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 it's, it seems to be subserved very, fairly similar, at least to some extent, neural system, particularly the amygdala. So essentially, the amygdala is very similar uh, for uh, humans, other prized monkeys, uh, rodents. And you can even go back uh, to uh, birds and fish. And they don't have a, an amygdala. They have what some people call the proto-amygdala. I always find funny that the smaller the animal, the longer the name. But um, it's, um, in fact, this is uh, what is in black. It's a lesion study. So if you lesion in goldfish, uh, if you lesion this part of the brain, the, the, um, the goldfish are no longer uh, afraid in the sense that they don't longer show conditioned fear responses. So it's not only the structure, but the function might be quite similar across species. So, so we can go with, with obviously some some differences back and forth from these, these species. And, in, and also the paradigms we can use are very similar, particularly fear conditioning. Um, it's just another view of the, of the amygdala. Just to, this is, I found this really uh, interesting that the, the amygdala, this is work by, by Schumann Amaral, the amygdala has about 12 million neurons. It's not a lot. And the central nucleus of the amygdala, which is the output of the amygdala, this is in humans, the output of the amygdala, which governs all our sort of defensive responses is 350,000 neurons. Um, so we can use, uh, this is uh, just a view of, the, of, the, uh, of my amygdala in there. There it is. Um, so um, 
we can we can study this in, in different species, and we can use several uh, sort of uh, uh, mechanisms. So you can do this in rats, and you can do this in humans. So this also shows some of the, of the difference between humans and other animals, and that has something we need to take into account, right? So, so there are similarities, but uh, uh, there, there are differences. Um, so in, in, in rats, uh, typically we measure condition responses using freezing. In humans, uh, one of the typical measures, there are many, but the typical measure is skin conductance response is sweat. Right? So you see changes in, in the sweat, in the, in the, which is governed by the bacteria and parasympathetic system, some of these. Um, so you see changes in skin conductance. And indeed, um, if you lesion the amygdala in humans, well, you don't, uh, but somebody else does. So this is the, the famous uh, SM patient, which is sort of the HM of emotion, uh, studied extensively by, by, by Antonio Damasio and colleagues. Um, she has a very uh, nice, um, a very specific and circumscribed uh, lesion of the amygdala. And she doesn't develop um, uh, conditioned skin conductance responses. So, uh, this is our controls, the condition stimulus and unpaired stimulus. Our stimulus has not been paired with the U.S. Has a nice, this is in two modalities, visual and auditory. It's a work by, by Antoine Bechara, that's, who's now here, in fact. Um, and, uh, and in SM, you don't see these developed responses, right? Um, also, in, in, you see if you do uh, imaging, for example, fMRI or PET, you see that, uh, indeed, uh, the conditioning procedure elicits some sort of amygdala activation, we can't really pinpoint whether it's the lateral nucleus or not, but it's an amygdala activation to a CS plus, that is a stimulus that has been paired with the, with the US compared to a stimulus that has not been paired to the US, sort of mirroring to some extent the animal literature. Uh, you also have uh, in the human brain increased response to the uh, condition stimulus in the sensory brain. This is uh, the fusiform we'll get to back in a second. It's just visual because here we used visual stimuli rather than auditory stimuli, but the idea is the same you have an enhanced response to the CS plus compared to the CS minus. So you have some, again, parallel here. Um, so now if you, if you study humans, you may want to um, study now, move from conditioning and say, okay, what about these intrinsic fear responses? What about these intrinsic emotional stimuli or, or, or threat stimuli? So uh, for, for uh, rodents, for rats and mice, it's easy. We put a cat. What do we do with humans? What's the, what's the cat equivalent for humans? Well, there are a few out there. Uh, you can't really see that very well, but that's a spider and that's a snake. Um, so people, some people tend to be afraid of uh, snakes and spiders. There's uh, uh, Ala Seligman, these are prepared stimuli. That is, not, we might not be uh, all uh, afraid of this uh, uh, stimuli, but it's easy to become afraid. With one, one learning experience, we become afraid for life. Uh, there's, there, uh, uh, susceptible to, to phobias, there's a lot of snake and spider phobias, whereas you don't get too many um, chair phobias. So this is the difference between certain stimuli that, um, although some people may have them as pets, but you know, for the most part, they're not uh, sort of particularly pleasant animals. So you could use uh, this with humans, and indeed there are a few studies, some done here in Montreal, looking at, at, at snakes and, and spiders, but, but usually done with phobics. Uh, people who have phobia to these, to these animals, and for example, say, the, you're interested in the response as a function of treatment. Right? But if you want to generalize this or to, to study something similar, but, but um, that, that you can, you know, don't have to rely on people's fears or not of snakes and spiders, you can look at, in these uh, pictures, again, we don't see them very well, but there's another important uh, sort of stimulus that is give, telling us a lot about what is going on. And that's the expressions of these guys. So if you see this, you have no idea what the threat is, but you know there's a threat somewhere, right? Particularly if James Bond is afraid of something, well, you should be afraid of that too, because um, when you see somebody afraid, there are two options. They're afraid of you, which is good, or more likely they're afraid of something than because you're, they're, they're, you're conspecific. They're afraid of something that you should also be afraid of. They're, they're signaling threat. So although fearful faces are not 
threat stimuli by themselves. They're not fearful stimuli by themselves. You're not afraid of, of a fearful face. They tell you something about the environment. They tell you about the presence or the possible presence of danger in the environment. And we're very good at detecting facial expressions and very good at interpreting them. And they're critical also for social interactions. And there are a lot of psychiatric disorders that are associated with deficits in this process. And so it's a very interesting uh, way of, of studying this. Uh, so we have facial expressions and also uh, you can also do uh, cross-species uh, studies and, and look at expressions in other animals. It's a bit more difficult. Um, so um, faces are indeed important and there's a part of the brain that seems to be um, almost dedicated to facial, uh, to face perception and to face processing and this is the face uh, fusiform area described originally by Nancy Canwisher. And basically, this is a part of the ventral temporal lobes, so, so the, part of the higher visual system, sort of sitting at the uh, bottom of your brain. And um, it responds to steam, visual stimuli in general, um, but it responds much more strongly to faces, to face stimuli to, that compared to anything else. So it really likes faces, and particularly it really likes human faces in the humans. So it's been uh, uh, called the, the, the face area, and uh, if you lesion this area, uh, you become, in most cases, prosopagnosic. That is, you don't recognize faces, you don't recognize individuals. So it seems to be involved, important for face processing, particularly for identity processing. So we have a part of the brain that actually cares about faces. So does the amygdala care about the emotional expressions of these faces? And the answer seems to be yes. Again, we have SM um, back, and SM has, seems to have uh, a hard time recognizing facial expressions, particularly those depicting fear. That's the same uh, uh, tested four times. It's not there are four SMs here. It's just that she was 64. These are healthy controls. These are brain damage controls. And you can see they're, so, they're asked to recognize or to, to, to uh, decide to, to judge on, on different expressions, so-called Eggman's uh, basic expressions. And she's quite good for most of them, but she's quite bad for fearful expressions. So it seems that the amygdala indeed um, is important for recognition of facial expressions, particularly those of fear. Um, there are about, by now, hundreds and hundreds of studies in neuroimaging, again, fMRI and PET, mostly fMRI, we'll get to back to this back if there's time, uh, where you compare fearful face to neutral face, you get amygdala activation, suggesting that the amygdala um, not only may be necessary, but also is involved in the processing of, of, of um, fearful faces. So fearful faces seem to be a good uh, stimulus it easier than conditioning, and it drives the amygdala, activates the amygdala, and it has some uh, meaning in terms of, of, of emotional uh, perception and, and, and survival to some extent. So fearful faces have been sort of used. Fearful faces are the equivalent in humans to conditioning in, in rats. It's the stimulus uh, of choice in most studies, simply, again, because it has uh, sort of a relevance, but also it's a very good uh, way of driving the amygdala. And it's a very easy uh, stimulus to, to control for, to manipulate, so, so, so forth. Um, the cortex, the fusiform cortex, also responds uh, to fearful faces. Well, that's not surprising, surprising because it responds to fear, but it responds more to fearful faces than to neutral faces. So it has this extra boost. Very much like in conditioning, we had the, ex the extra boost in the sensory areas, including the fusiform. Sure. So you get back to the question, you know, the chicken of the, or the egg, the amygdala of the fusiform. Same thing. So is the, is the amygdala response to, um, or enhanced response to fearful faces simply because the fusiform fits into the amygdala and the fusiform likes fearful faces more than neutral faces, so it's sending stronger signal and the amygdala is simply responding more? Well, um, we, tried this, uh, we tried to get at this uh, work with uh, Patrick uh, Villemier and, um, and others, uh, John Driver and, and Ray Dolan back in, in, in London, London, the other one, UK. Um, and so if you're having controls, this is a different view, it's a sagittal view, it's a view cut like that. And that's the fusiform uh, gyrus activation. So if you compare fear to neutral faces, you get the expected enhanced response uh, in the fusiform. Um, so we wanted uh, lesions of the amygdala. Well, we didn't have access to patients like SM, and we wanted to do a group study. We didn't, because in imaging, you need to do, you have several subjects. So the, best, uh, the next best thing is to use patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. Patients with uh, TLE, uh, even pre-surgically, many of them have uh, damage to, they have damage to the medial temporal lobes, unilateral, but uh, in many cases, that damage uh, includes the amygdala, but in others don't. So there's sclerosis uh, that may or may not include the amygdala. 
And what happens if you take subjects, participants who have unilateral damage to their amygdala because of uh, sclerosis, um, they show no enhanced response to the fearful faces compared to the neutral. They're not prosopagnosic. They recognize faces. They're fusiform is intact. They just don't get the extra boost uh, uh, for fearful faces. And this is not due. They all have hippocampal damage because they, it was, they were selected for a different study, which has sort of piggybacked in that study. Uh, so how do we know it's not just the hippocampus or, or having epilepsy per se? Uh, you can have another group where they have hippocampal damage but no amygdala damage. Uh, and they're clinically identical to these guys. And they show the, the perfectly healthy uh, fusiform activation to fearful faces. So this doesn't prove, but suggests very strongly that this boost, this enhanced response in the fusiform, in the sensory cortex to fearful faces um, is at least in part driven by the amygdala. Very much like um, I was showing you earlier that this enhanced response, this late response in the auditory cortex in rats, the conditioning, was amygdala dependent because if you listen the amygdala, it was gone. Well, something similar, this is not conditioning, this is not the cortex, but something similar seems to be happening. Okay? Well, switch gears a little bit. Um, life is uh, complicated and busy, there's always people everywhere, um, and we still have to do things, right? So we're very good at uh, focusing on what we want to focus on and filter out any distracting information in the environment. So, um, I don't know if you can, I'm not going to start playing with lights, but um, you can see this little kid there reading, this other guy reading, this uh, mother doing something to her, you know, tying up her, her daughter's uh, dress in the middle of this, you know, uh, metro or subway, people coming in and out and uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, you have uh, people uh, selling stuff, so they start yelling. And, and uh, uh, if you ever go to Mexico City, they actually have boom boxes because they sell hard CDs. So you have this music sort of very, very loud, blaring, uh, uh, blasting everywhere. And you can still talk to your friend or read your book and things. So we're very good at filtering out information that is irrelevant and focus on what is sort of the goal directed uh, 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 task at hand. And this, this filtering out of information or this enhanced uh, processing of the, of the relevant information has obviously uh, neural correlates, otherwise it wouldn't happen. And um, you can show that uh, in many different ways. So let's say I present to you this array of figures, of pictures. So I have faces and houses. And I want to compare the brain responses of this to that. All these two similar identical. So if everything goes well, you have zero. Right? If you have some, something, there might be a problem. Well. Yes, that's true, but you can manipulate something. You can manipulate the attentional focus. So I can tell you, in some trials, I present this very, very quickly, and I, in some trials I tell you, just pay attention to the horizontal pictures, whatever they are, and tell me if they're the same or different. And in other trials, I can tell you, just pay attention to the vertical pictures and tell me whether they're the same or different. And if I present this for about 200 milliseconds or so, it's really hard to see the other. You have to focus on the ones that you know you have to focus, and you don't have time to focus on the other ones. And we have some behavioral data that to prove that. So if you compare now these two exact same stimuli, but in one case you were paying attention to the horizontal, and the other case to the vertical, then you have in attention terms, attention to houses versus attention to faces. Conversely, if you do the opposite, you have attention to faces and compared to attention to houses. The stimuli are identical. It's just your attentional focus that is changed. If you do that, what you have is when you pay attention to faces compared to houses, you get fusiform activation in the same spot as when you compare straight faces to straight houses. So you got an enhanced response uh, to the same stimulus because of attention. And if you do the opposite, you get parahippocampal gyrus, which likes is kind of the house area of the brain, um, and um, and you get exactly the same. So you can have the exact same stimulus, but you can manipulate. Uh, the response by attention. And that's part of this, uh, what we think is, is, a, is the mechanism uh, through which we can uh, focus uh, on, on a particular stimulus and filter out irrelevant information. And that's, that's great to, for reading the newspaper on the metro, but there are some situations where that might not be ideal. There might may be some stimuli out there in the environment that you can afford to ignore, and you're already sort of figuring out what, what I mean. So you need some sort of mechanism that will still allow you to respond to the stimulus. And that's not a new idea. Uh, that's uh, Herb Simon's interrupt system. Uh, he proposed this 
uh, 45 years ago, um, and he basically said that in order to have a proper cognitive system, um, you need two things. So the central nervous system, this is the abstract, it's a bit long, but um, you have, uh, in order to live in, a, in, a, in a, an environment uh, with multiple needs and unpredictable threats and opportunities, you need a goal-terminating mechanism, so you need a system that allows you to go one goal at a time, but also you need an interruption mechanism, having the properties usually ascribed to emotion, um, allowing the processor to respond to urgent needs in real time. So you need a, a system that will run substantially in parallel, these are his words, and that will be capable of interrupting and setting aside ongoing programs. That is, when you have a program but you have an urgent need to attend to, you need to switch um, things. So let me show the example, if it ever works. So that's the goal, and that's the threat. Right? So I don't know if you saw that, but he saw, he saw the reflection on the girl's eyes. Um, so, so clearly, uh, James Bond is very interested in his goal at hand. Um, but, in order, but there's a threat uh, that arrives in, in the environment. This threat arrives, so his, fo his attention is clearly focused and he's, he's filtering out all distracting stimuli, but uh, he realizes, or he, do, uh, he doesn't have to, time to realize, and there's a bit uh, the idea of this, um, that there's a threat, there's an imminent threat, and if he doesn't deal with that threat, his goal is not going to be fulfilled. So he needs to uh, be, first detect that threat, and then deal with that threat. And then he may come back to his original goal. Um, so, um, so this is Simon's interrupt system. Um, so we, we, we saw this uh, when we were doing uh, work uh, with Joe and, and collaboration with uh, David Servan Shriver and, and, and Jonathan Cohen. And uh, obviously when uh, David had done his PhD with, with, with Simon, so um, we thought we have the system, or at least part of the system. It clearly, um, we have the amygdala that detects a threat. We have the subcortical pathway that seems to be uh, it, because it doesn't go through the cortex, it's slightly less uh, modulated by attentional, uh, selective attention um, mechanisms. So maybe uh, the amygdala and this, this thalamo amygdala pathway are at least part uh, or, or, or candidates to be uh, in this, in this uh, interrupt uh, system. So we wanted to test that. So the first thing you want to test is whether the amygdala indeed responds to this threat stimuli or threat-related stimuli uh, outside the focus of attention. Well, we have the paradigm. We take uh, Nancy Kanwishers and, and Eva Wojtylik uh, paradigm of, of houses and faces, and we add a twist. We add another factor, fearful or neutral faces. So now the faces can be attended or unattended. That's the attention factor. But then we add another factor, um, facial expression. Fearful and neutral. We know that fearful faces activate the amygdala. When we look at them, when we have them in, in front of us and nothing else in the scanner. So what happens when we present these faces in the unattended location? Well, the fusiform responds both to attention or is modulated both by selective attention and by uh, emotion, by expression. And it seems to be doing that in a sort of additive uh, way. So uh, it responds the strongest to attended fearful faces and the least to the least interesting ones and attended neutral faces. And that sort of makes sense. It's a graded response. What happens to the amygdala? The amygdala doesn't care about attention. The amygdala responds to fearful faces exactly the same way, whether they are uh, task relevant or task irrelevant, or they are attended or unattended. So this is, again, work with, uh, that, uh, with uh, Patrick, uh, Villemier, and others. Uh, we're very excited about that. The, this was replicated uh, using different paradigms. Uh, this is by Adam Anderson uh, when he was working with Liz Phelps. He's now in, 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 uh, in Toronto next door. And you can, this was object-based attention. So now you have them overlap, so you have no possible uh, complaints about you know, eye movements and stuff like that. Sometimes, depending on the color, you have to pay attention to the face or to the house, and you get the same effect. Uh, the fear responses in the amygdala uh, don't care about that. Um, in fact, people have, um, and this is what Joe was referring to, uh, he, people have pushed this uh, to the extreme and shown that the amygdala responds to uh, a, a 
emotional stimuli, either fearful faces or conditioned stimuli, uh, in the absence of awareness. Uh, what does that mean? Backward masking. Right? We can discuss that. Um, so these are subliminally presented stimuli. You present a, a fearful face or a conditioned stimulus visually, and immediately, for a very brief time, typically 15 milliseconds or so, 16, a refresh uh, rate of the screen of the computer, and immediately you present something else. And if I ask you about, uh, with the attention uh, paradigm, if I ask you about the unattended faces, if I stop the experiment and the faces were in unattended location, I ask you about the faces, you knew there were faces there. But if I ask you, was it a man or a woman, you were a chance. If I ask you, was it fearful or neutral, you were a chance. If I ask you, I show you two pictures, as, was it John or, or, or James or John O'Mara, you were a chance. So you have what's sometimes called um, inattentional blindness. So you, you, you see the stimuli, but you don't, ha you don't really process them very fully. Here you don't even see the stimuli. If I ask you, if I have in some trials, I have the, the target, the, the mass stimulus, and others, I don't. I ask you, was there anything else? Uh, you're a chance, right? So, and, and the amygdala, again, seems to not care about this. It seems to respond to this. Now, in the interest of, of uh, full disclosure and fun, uh, there's another completely different side of the story. Uh, this, this, this study, this particular the, the original attention paper, uh, done already more than 10 years ago, sort of sparked a, a, a friendly and sometimes not so friendly um, debate. Um, and you're going to hear the, the other side of the story by Luis Pessoa next week. I think, in fact, it's exactly next uh, Saturday. So he'll tell you his own view about, about this role of interactions between attention and, and, and awareness and, and emotion. Um, OK. So um, so I think by now it should be fairly clear that the amygdala, um, as Dr. House said at the beginning, and Dr. Ledoux said earlier, um, well, both I idols. Um, uh, the amygdala responds to threat stimuli, uh, fearful faces. Um, so is that all? Well, that's what's been studied the most. Uh, but if you read the literature, or in my case, you watch uh, more TV, you find other things. I just I have something that I want to say. Inside the park. Well, what is the idea that the heart is the seat of love and strength of character is ancient, but metaphoric. I mean, so now we have Dr. Brennan um, saying that the amygdala is not only involved in fear. Well, I looked and there's no amygdala. It's not a different structure. Apparently, it's just the amygdala. Um, it's just a sort of regional accent, I guess. Um, and not only is it involved in fear, but it's also involved in love and strength of character. So. Um, is that true? What about, uh, what about other emotions? Is, does the amygdala care about emotions? Well, uh, studies with SM suggested another, a few other uh, patient and patient groups suggest that really fear is, is, is important, maybe anger a little bit, because uh, so if you stimulate the amygdala in, in patients uh, with, um, with epilepsy, for example, they tend to have anger uh, responses and sometimes fearful responses. Uh, SM had trouble recognizing fearful faces. Um, so. What is it? But the, every now and then, you know, there's a study popping out saying the amygdala responds to happy faces, to sad faces. So, um, how do you how do we get about that? Well, uh, we did that um, uh, some time ago. Uh, Karin Sargeri, a former student in the lab, we decided to. Uh, we, should have, we wanted to run an experiment where we had all the possible conditions of all uh, you know, uh, pictures, faces, words, positive, negative. Uh, that was too much work. Um, so we decided to use other people's data. Uh, so we conducted a meta-analysis that you know is basically doing imaging for free. Um, you take other people's data and you put it together and you publish a paper. Um, so we did that for visual stimuli because that's what's been most studied. So it was a meta-analysis of functional imaging size PET and fMRI of the perception. We're only interested in perception, uh, studied not memory, not uh, anything like that, decision making and so on, uh, of visual stimuli in healthy individuals. We're not interested in po populations. And we selected, so we were not interested in the areas that pop up, but we're interested in the amygdala, so we selected those studies that identify an activation in the amygdala, right? So you basically look for anything sort of amygdala, amygdala complex, I mean, anything that's out with amyg goes in, right? Everything that's not goes out. Um, there are about 400, or this was until 2007, I think, 
about 444 <laughs> studies of emo per per perception of visual uh, emotional stimuli in health individuals, that's a lot, um, out of which f 159 studies report dynamic activation, uh, leading to 365 peaks because there are different comparisons. So we looked at that. Uh, the first interesting thing is that uh, you may wonder, where is the amygdala? Well, the amygdala is there. Those are the activations uh, supposedly in the amygdala, right? So uh, people, when it comes to amygdala, are very generous. Um, so once something, so, so uh, clearly we have no way of deciding whether it's the lateral nucleus or the, or the uh, central nucleus. Um, we can't even be sure that it's the amygdala, but we take the author's word for that because sometimes these are the peaks and sometimes the cluster of the activation may actually go into the amygdala. So, um, but, but you know, keep that in mind when, when, when you read the literature. Um, so if you compare negative versus positive stimuli, um, 227 reported activations in the amygdala for negative stimulus, only 28 for positive. So, okay, the amygdala uh, hands down responds to negative stimuli. But the problem here is one of the uh, sort of perhaps a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. We know the amygdala is involved in fear. So two things, we test only fear. So of these 444 studies, the vast majority use negative stimuli, particular fearful faces. And there's, a pro there's an issue. Uh, if you present fearful faces in any study of imaging, and you don't have amygdala activation, you don't publish. So trust me, you will find an amygdala activation. Uh, whereas if you present a sad face or a happy face or a contemptuous face, the jury is out on that one. So if you have an amygdala activation, great. If you don't, you can still sort of find your way around. So there might be a selection or, or, or some, not the selection, but the, uh, a bias in statistics. Uh, why is that? Because uh, sort of paraphrasing, um, or well, um, you know, all activations are significant, but some are more significant than others. Um, as you may know, in, in, in functional neuroimaging, uh, the early studies were, were, because it was very expensive and complicated, would go down particularly the PET to six subjects. Now our size is using 100 subjects, so the reliability is, is very different. And the threshold uh, of, of statistical, when you decide that something is statistically significant, activations are not, um, uh, the results are not binary, but our decision are, is binary. So we call something activates or doesn't activate, it's simply a statistical threshold. The statistical threshold would be 0.05, uh, imposed by, by Fisher uh, 100 years ago, 2.00001 with additional cons constraints in terms of voxels, uh, cluster size, and so on and so forth. So um, how do you take that into account? Well, instead of counting uh, the, 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 the stimuli that show one thing or other, which is the so-called vote counting approach, which is what most meta-analysis do, you may look at those who report amygdala activation. What is the magnitude of that activation? So we don't have that bias. If they, if they say it's active, how active it is. If you do that sort of a quantitative meta-analysis, um, what you find is that indeed, in fact, the amygdala seems to be active for all facial expressions, significantly so. So it responds, so this is the number of studies that report it. So yes, there are many more studies reporting amygdala activation for fearful faces, but that's because there are more studies. Um, but the magnitude is, all, in all cases, uh, significantly different from zero, and if anything, is stronger for happy than for the rest. There's no difference across emotions, and there's a stronger difference uh, in case of faces. Okay, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, the second thing, just with the, in the last minute that I have, uh, is um, I talked because, as I said, in the visual domain, um, in, the, in the human domain, in particular in neuroimaging. We have focused on on, face, on on visual stimuli, but in the in the auditory, in the rat domain, we focus more on auditory. So, what about uh, that? What about modality? Well, so I, I showed you that this, or I com hopefully convinced you that this stimulus is a very powerful stimulus, uh, engages the amygdala and so on and so forth. But there's something missing there. You see, it's almost coffee time, so that's why I do it. Um, <laughs> You're missing that. So most emotional expressions are multimodal, and particularly um, if you want to save this poor woman, um, if you are going to be guided by visual information only, you have to be taking the shower with her. Otherwise, you're not going to see her. However, the scream can be heard you know, across uh, rooms and buildings. So if anything, auditory information is more powerful, or at least uh, doesn't require a direct line of view. 
Uh, surprisingly, they are not surprising. There, there are, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of studies of uh, visual uh, expressions, facial expressions. There are very few about vocal expressions. Although the voice also has a, a, a apparently dedicated area of the brain, an area in the temporal lobes, the superior temporal lobe seems to prefer voices, either with speech or non-speech uh, content, and prefers more human voices than other type of voices. So we have kind of similar mechanisms. What happens with the amygdala? Well, the amygdala does respond to, uh, at least in one study that we did, um, uh, the amygdala does respond to emotional expressions through, the, through voice, through vocalizations, um, non-linguistic, so we have, ha we have fear, screams, uh, sadness, crying, and you have happy laughter and, and sexual pleasure, and it seems to respond to all of this, and again, if anything, at least in the right amygdala, the response to the positive one is stronger than to the negative ones. Right? So this again shows that indeed the amygdala seems to, in humans, respond to other uh, type of stimuli and other modalities and, and uh, other uh, emotional stimuli. So um, let me uh, activate your amygdala in a, in a sort of uh, not so uh, traumatic way and, and finish that. So, <laughs> thanks for that.